Okay, welcome everybody. Christos Anesti. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the spring season of sharing in song. Um, this is the first tonight of five workshops that we'll be presenting for you and others, all of them dealing with the um, the hymns, the, the signature hymns that occur on the, the feast days that follow Pascha in hopes that if not this year, you might be able to incorporate them into your singing or um, surely um, for next year. The purpose of sharing in song is to help us to develop a, a deeper understanding of our faith through a better understanding of the hymns. So tonight we're going to start with the Megalinadion for the entire Paschal season. It's something that we'll encounter every one of the six Sundays um, of Pascha, starting with Pascha itself and then the five Sundays following it. So we hope you um, learn a lot about it and especially we hope you enjoy tonight's session. First, I'd like to um, introduce you to Father James Behrend, Behrens, who is one of our um, one of our uh, clinicians tonight. And uh, Father comes to us, he's presently the Plois Dominus of the Holy Spirit Church in Rochester, New York. Um, but he's traveled around a lot in, in many different parishes. He Just before Rochester, he was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then a lot of parishes in Alabama, Tennessee, I'm uh, not Alabama, I'm sorry, in the Atlanta metropolis. Um, he has an interesting path that he took toward orthodoxy, um, starting off in political science in college and then getting a master's in biblical studies, but then um, uh, sort of through his love of a variety of things like history and literature, um, and especially Bob Dylan, um, and then meeting Archbishop Demetrius and coming into contact with uh, Father Callistos Ware and Father um, Peter Gilchrist, he came to Orthodoxy. And uh, um, actually also um, for everybody who's thinking about this, um, also through the Greek festival that was part of his path to Orthodoxy. So it's always good to, to, um, to think about what the values of a Greek festival can be. Um, so we're very pleased today to welcome you, Father. And if you would start us off with an opening prayer and then just continue right on with your presentation. Blessed be our God, always now to the ages of ages, amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and to those in the tombs bestowing life. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can gather together. We thank you for the wonderful gift that you gave because you so loved the world and that through the death and resurrection, and uh, ultimately to be reunited with you, um, as we can be with one another and you each and every Sunday, every time we gather in Holy Communion. Uh, give us wisdom, illumine us, illumine us, as we comprehend this magnificent story of the gospel. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> I recall an article uh, in Time Magazine, March 21st, 2005. The only reason I recall it is I, I utilized it way back then. And it uh, was talking about, it was highlighting the Protestants and their, their interest uh, in the Theotokos. She was there at the cross, yet Protestants seldom talk about Jesus' mother at Easter or at most other times but they are starting to now. That's the way the article started. And this, um, this exercise uh, that Professor Pappas and uh, Professor uh, Minton uh, had for me, which I'm most grateful for, and uh, probably just like Kevin, this is a ongoing process. We just ran out of time um, because it's a, a wealth of information. Um, this me Megalinarian, or a hymn to the Theotokos is primarily is what it is, a hymn to the Theotokos. Um, the most common one uh, you all know is the uh, Axionistine, which is in Chrysostom's liturgy after the consecration of gifts. Um, the, the Slavic uh, 
it, it takes on uh, different forms, uh, Byzantine and Slavic. Uh, in the Slavic, there is also uh, one that starts off, uh, we magnify. And so, here. go ahead, what was that? Oh, yeah, I thought you were pronouncing what it, what it was in Slavic. And, uh, um, and so, uh, the, 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 but it's also found in other Byzantine services, such as the uh, Paracleses. Um, it is sung uh, as uh, at Pascha in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth Sunday of Pascha. And here, Kyriakos, I have Q Kyriakos. So that first one in which we have the one that Barbara sent me um, of the Sundays that this is shown. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and you can keep that up there for a while. Um, it, it, it is not sung on the second Sunday of Pascha or uh, St. Thomas Sunday. This uh, not being sung there uh, seems to affirm uh, almost a negative space sort of way um, the theology behind this very hymn and behind uh, what is going on here and why we sing hymns to the Theotokos. So I would like to um, uh, start by um, going through, and I'll, I'll we'll sort of uh, cue this here, although, um, yeah, can you close, let's, let's go to the other one now. And you will notice um, that the reference to the uh, to in the, in the second verse of the first one, which I, I call Pascha in the third and sixth week, you will see the phrase "O pure one," just at the end there, "O pure Theotokos," at the rising of the one you bore. In the second verse of the uh, fourth week, you will see "Lord's Gate, City." city animate rejoice and in the second week in the second verse of the fifth week you will see divine gate of the light it is through the theotokos being christ being born the gate the the divine gate of the light animating the city that it is through that birth the virgin birth jesus christ came into the world for us and for our salvation. This is why throughout Orthodoxy, you see the um, there, any reference, every any reference to the mother uh, is is affirming the virgin birth. It affirms his divinity, but a reference to his mother affirms his humanity. Uh, let me just clarify so that because is born of a mother, born of a woman. It is affirming his humanity. And we all know from the uh, councils, especially in the uh, f uh, fifth century, you, you have that, that uh, the, the balance between divinity and hum humanity. And it took on, in the, the following councils, the fifth and sixth, also it took on uh, other, but it was always trying to struggle with, find out where was it? fully God, fully man. He was born of a woman. Father was the Holy Spirit, impregnated by the Holy Spirit. So any reference to his mother is always affirming his humanity. Um, you can imagine, why are we doing this at resurrection time? Um, you can imagine skeptics, doubters, Doubting Thomases um, may, be, may be thinking to themselves, well, was he really human? You know, to be able to rise from the dead, we didn't really, uh, then he was divine. He was not really human, which is the, uh, the entire point of the thing. He was fully God, fully human, which for us, the church took four centuries to finalize that, to come to that understanding. And we are the fortunate recipients of that. Or another one, did he really die? Well, 
uh, as I mentioned last night to uh, Vicki and Barbara and Kevin and uh, Kitty Akos, is that uh, it brought to mind uh, Father Elke Viadis Calibus uh, at Holy Cross when he would do his Holy Week presentation. He was dead, I tell you, dead as a doornail. He didn't, the, the tomb, and remember the soldiers came by and were breaking the legs of the two thieves, but when it came to Christ, they saw that he was already dead. He didn't break his legs. They pierced his side with the lance, and out came blood and water. And was, now, now we go again, to second, uh, the second Sunday, Pascha, Sunday of Th Thomas, the reference, that was a closed room that the disciples were in. It was locked. It was sealed. They, they were scared to death Hello. that the Pharisees were going to come nope. after them. I can't get out of what I do. So the question could be, well, was this a ghost? And remember what Christ is saying, put your hand in my side. Put your put your uh, hands in my my uh, fingers in the nail prints to affirm his fleshliness, his his humanity, but that he was really there. It was not a ghost. It was not. It was a true resurrected body. So the. Um, this is uh, when when we always see the Theotokos. Um, where is her place on the iconostasis for the priest that's right there on the right for the fo folks facing it's uh, uh, on the left left hand side but it is the preeminent prominent place for a created being nothing higher nothing more it's the theotokos and when the theotokos is depicted she was always depicted with christ this is affirming the, the divinity, the humanity, but this is why Theotokos in Byzantine uh, services plays such a prominent part. It was understood. Constantinople, the, the, the God-protected city, the Theotokos, the Akathis, all those things that we sing, we're constantly tying those things uh, in. Uh, what do we say? Honoring her with hymns let us magnify the Theotokos, the mother of light, and the Magnificat of Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 46, um, which back to the we magnify that the Slavics uh, use, uh, that we're constantly uh, mentioning this with the Theotokos. Tying in with the second point of many that we could make, uh, I'm not really touching on rejoicing, rejoice being one of the fruits of the Spirit, Love, joy, very prominent. The joy that we have in this resurrection, the joy that we share with one another uh, over the fact that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again for us and for our salvation, that we may have eternal life. Who or whom is being illumined? Um, again, if we go in the second verse of uh, the, the top one there, Pascha, three, uh, Pascha plus three and six, you will see the line, O New Jerusalem. In the next one, you see the Lord's Gate, which I had referred to the, uh, as well, the Lord's Gate City Animate. It's, it's the city. It's the people. It's the re represents of the people. And, at, uh, and he is, in the last one, he has fully illumined all the faithful. That is what, uh, that's, we are the ones that are illumined. We are this, uh, we are joining in this song because it's we that have uh, received this light. Um, and so that's, that's the, the church. And we are the light of the world. Uh, so um, how, how am I doing? I uh, just want to uh, touch on uh, the hymnographer, which um, this is actually, it's the very same um, uh, as uh, identical words to the ninth ode of the Easter uh, Orthos canon, the ninth ode. And uh, that, that is most often attributed to St. John of Damascus, late 7th, 8th uh, uh, century. So that's where, that's where we get this from. In all likelihood, I, I, it's, that's what it is. So, okay. The balance of my time, I yield to Kevin.
Am I on the spot already? <laughs> all right, I guess that means yes. <clears throat> well, very nice to be here. So nice to see you all. And uh, Kevin, Kevin yeah. just I'm sorry, I was muted yeah. when I was talking to answer ah, the question. Okay. Um, if, uh, uh, if there's one or two questions, Barbara will sort of handle them with father right now, if they're short ones. Barbara, you're muted. I'm sorry, people, most of the questions were, why can't I get on? What should I do? <laughs> uh, there's a big mix up with the, uh, the registration, but I'm glad people have persisted and they came on. Right now, uh, there weren't questions. I think people were, uh, a lot of the people came on after the fact, after the time that I had mentioned, if you had questions to send them um, to me through chat. But we'll we'll have a, a question and answer period at the end. I like to think, Barbara, that that means they understood everything that I said, and that, I, that I that I made it possibly very clear. you were you were thorough and clear, so they they weren't confused. I'm yeah. muting myself, Kevin. All the best. <laughs> uh, oh, thanks a lot, Father. Oh, I'll, I'll ask him in, in the follow, Kevin. Um, I want to introduce. I want to welcome you and introduce you as well. Um, we're very pleased pleased to have you with us. And uh, um, some of you may know that um, Kevin, as a professional, is a, a classical concert violinist and does a lot of his work at the University of North Carolina um, and uh, both in giving recitals and playing with symphony orchestras and chamber music um, ensembles and also was the founder and the artistic director of the Green Mountain Chamber Music Festival in Vermont, which he now has been to for 20 years. Is that right, Kevin? Uh, this is the 17th season. 17th year. Um, every summer, every time around, right around July. We know it because that's the time of the National Forum meeting and Kevin is always busy. <laughs> But um, also, um, um, Kevin has another life in orthodoxy, and uh, he's been a choir director of several choirs, um, both in our jurisdiction, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, as well as the OCA. And uh, he also had an interesting journey to orthodoxy. Um, way back in 1980, he was um, curious and decided to visit um, Nuskeet Monastery at a retreat. And at the time, if this is right, Kevin, New Skeet was a Byzantine Catholic. Well, I thought they were Byzantine Catholic well, and I was Catholic. So I went there and I got there and found out that they had just entered the OCA. Oh, I see. It was I a see. tremendous shock. Yeah. And, but it only took him four years to decide the shock was a, a very positive one. And four years later, he became Orthodoxy and, um, uh, has been with us ever since. Um, in addition to being a, a director in parish choirs, um, Kevin's probably most known for his prolific works in, uh, in composing liturgical music, especially he was one of the pioneers in development of English music with English texts. Um, and more recently got very heavily involved in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese by being a member of the Oli Mazi team that worked with the Archdiocese and the Holy Synod and the Department of Religious Education to uh, create the music um, for the new standard translation in English and whatever changes also were necessary in the Greek. And then from there, he went on to create a four part choral arrangement um, that parishes can use with the hymnal, with the new hymnal of the new, using the new English translation. So that's what he's been busiest about um, with us um, lately. I'm sure he's been busy with his violin people too. Kevin, we're glad to have you here and uh, it's now your turn to go. Thank you, Vicki. Thanks everybody. As I say, so nice to see you all. Um, so I'd like to ask you to turn to the last page of my handout um, where there's a, a little chart, which uh, I'm, I'm told, oh, thank you, Kiriakos, that's great. Um, so the very end of this, um, there's a, a, a little chart that shows you uh, the pattern 
that we we see it's 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 a simple pattern uh it's it shouldn't um feel mystifying it shouldn't be uh uh difficult to understand uh and it should be i think pleasing i think the whole idea of this kind of liturgical sequence is that we should we should enjoy a kind of um um order that we see that that's that's kind of poetic uh we are calling the 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 first sunday pascha lest there be any confusion the first sunday after is the second sunday uh which is the sunday of thomas but anyway uh you can see that uh there are there are bookends the the first and the final sunday of the season are the same megalinarian and then um in the middle the myrrh bearing almost the middle the myrrh bearing women uh that's that's the same again and then there are these three other ones uh the the sunday of thomas is its own thing it's not like as you can see from the text it's not like uh, the fourth and the fifth which all start with the same opening verse and then have uh a, a second what you would call triparian uh after um so in fact the chart that uh father james showed us said ah don't even think about thomas uh, sunday because it's you know we're not going to go into that but actually it's good for you to know um i mean it's coming right up and uh i know that there there is um the possibility of uh if if covid isn't uh, reducing your choirs too much there's the possibility of singing this um i should explain my own uh work in this regard um when i was first trying to figure out you know i was going to a greek parish uh in texas and then i moved here uh, to north carolina and i was trying to figure out what do what do parishes need because there was i was told you know people wanted to sing more in english and there there wasn't anything you know back in uh the late 80s when i you know started with this um there wasn't anything for them so um i started doing my you know honestly sort of intuitive and somewhat amateurish thing with this and um along the way i realized you know here we are sunday of thomas where's the megalinarian and i saw i mean in in, in those days what did somebody go to well well we have anastasia you know that was that was it you know that was um the go-to thing well you look there and you don't see a megalinarian for the sunday of thomas you certainly don't see the special ones for the fourth and fifth sunday of the season so it's interesting to think you know what were people doing um in the 1940s in the u.s in in our parishes i mean did they just well they maybe they say let the chanter do it i hope the chanter was able to do do this uh but but anyway now um people are getting uh the resources to to handle these liturgical uh moments as they should and and for some people uh there's a there's an element of um you know uncertainty like what is this where did this come from i never used to do this why are we doing it now um i i don't know if father james knows i don't know if anybody knows um the fourth and fifth sundays in particular i really don't know how many parishes did these uh changed versions i know for example the slavs they just sing the angel cried for the whole season so that suggests that this is maybe a local thing and maybe it's fairly recent uh but anyway that's i think that kind of thing is interesting um and it shouldn't uh, the value of considering that i believe is that it shouldn't fill us with worry well we haven't been doing this right for all these years or you know how how are we going to understand this this strange new structure it's not all that strange a structure and um it's just really recently that uh resources have been available so now we can we can have a richer series of texts through this season okay so that's um that's the pattern and and vicky asked me to really make sure that everybody was uh, able to sort of stare at that that little chart for a moment and see yeah yeah it all kind of makes sense nothing too complicated there all right so now i would like to talk about two two areas of i think interest um one is the character the musical character of these pieces and the other is just ideas about translations and settings and you know i think that'll be of interest beyond our uh focus on these particular uh pieces of uh, liturgical 
uh, hymnody. So, first of all, character. Obviously, we're talking about joyful energy here. You read the text and, you, you know, it's written all over the thing. Um, so, how do we express this joyful energy in our singing, right? These are uh, minor pieces. They're, they're, for our musical culture in general, minor is considered like serious and not too jolly, right? So, uh, we have to make sure to think about how quickly we sing, how strong the uh, style of singing is. I would suggest that we don't want to be uh, smooth and refined. I think there's a gutsiness about these things. The, the, um, I'd like to have us turn now to page, um, well, let's turn to page four in this book, and I have a metronome marking, uh, and I have a metronome on my phone, which I'm going to give you the joy of hearing through Zoom. So that's what I, that's the slowest I suggested. Now, so that would be something like, um, the angel cried out to the, all right? So that's pretty fast for, for some, I suppose. Um, I'd like to say something about tempo has to do with how big is the church, how many people in the group, um, and how secure are they with the peace. Um, but in general, I would say we should push for a certain kind of energetic presentation of this. So that's the basic Paschal Megalinarian. If we turn to page, um, 12. So now we have the opening, of course, that's the same. And then we have uh, toward the bottom of the first of that page of the two page thing uh, with one voice with the faithful. Um, well, I wrote a different metronome marking there. Uh, I suggested to be slower, which would be, let's see, 69 would be this, here's 70. With one voice, we the faithful. So that's a lot slower, right? After the energetic beginning. Um, what's the reason for that? Well, there's a couple thoughts. Uh, certainly, it's a more reflective text. Um, <laughs> on a practical level, people don't know this as well as they know the angel cried. You know, the, the, the Paschal Megalinarian is just, you know, we sing it more. Um, so... Also, it's a kind of clear indication that the, these are two different uh, kind of liturgical elements. The opening thing, it's, it's kind of, you could call it a verse, and then the treparion, which, which changes by the week. So uh, doing that a bit slower, especially in the fourth and fifth uh, Sunday, makes a lot of sense. So that's just a thought or two about tempo. Um, style of singing. Uh, what do I think of there? Well, do we want um, a certain kind of detachment? Can we get um, less connection and more accent as we sing through something that's supposed to be uh, full of vigorous energy? Yeah, so let's, um, I suggest uh, looking at page six, right? That's a, a different version of, um, of this, uh, of this thing. Um, so if we sing, um, I wish I wasn't hoarse. I obviously should have had a used better vocal technique last week, as I sang, but, uh, but I am hoarse and someday I'll learn to sing better. Um, we don't want to sing the angel. We want to sing the angel, right? So there's an accent cried out to the woman, woman full of grace, not woman full of grace, woman full of grace. So uh, I would say a certain separation should be what we expect. Um, the English choir school it will not be our model here, okay? And then last of all, in this character idea, I'd like to talk about shape of phrases. And that has something to do with volume. Uh, and something to do with speed. So if you look look at the, the page that's up now, and you see that it has uh, 
a clear trajectory. It, it starts pretty high, it ends a little lower. Then it goes higher again, okay? And I think the logical thing, I mean, you, do you see dynamics here? Of course not. What, what, why would you expect that? But, but any musician would be sensitive to the shape of this uh, line and show with their voice um, that th the highest stuff had uh, more energy and there would be a, f a feeling of repose when it would go down, finish the phrase a little lower, uh, you would also be a little softer. So you wanna make sure uh, that you don't look at this and think, uh, number one, uh, this is solemn. I mean, you know, we're in church, we can't get too excited. Uh, no, this is, this is joyous energy. Number two, you want to make sure that you see the shape of the melody uh, and you honor that by creating uh, a line, a phrase structure that is clearly suggested by the notes, even though, you know, you're not going to find many uh, um, pieces of music with, with all kinds of dynamics and crescendos and retards and so forth. Um, so now what I suggest is let's sing. Um, my understanding is that together we can listen to these funny little um, sound files that Finale creates and people can sing along even, you know, in the privacy of your own home, you can sing along and see if uh, you hear at least a little bit of slowing down at the end of phrases, uh, perhaps uh, you can let yourself get louder when it gets high. I mean, many of us, I can't sing really high and be soft. I don't have that kind of control. It's the natural thing to sing bigger when you're, when you're singing high. So that'll kind of happen by itself. But let's, so Kiriakos, could we do, uh, I would like to do two versions of the Haskell Megalonarian. First, the one on page four, which is the one published in 1997. And then we'll go uh, to the revised one and then I'll, we'll just sing through it first and then I'll talk about like, why the heck did I do this 25 years later? All right, so, uh, so Kiriakos, can you just go yeah, ahead and just, start playing just that? Just a quick song? reminder to make sure people are on mute so that we're not listening to your private solo. And believe um, me, I'll put myself on mute. Thank you. We're not hearing the music. Now, if there's trouble, I do have this on my computer, so I can I Let's can try. try one more time. I think I had a setting turned on that I didn't need to have turned on. Let's try it one more time. Give me a thumbs up, Kevin, if you can hear this. So now without any talk at all, we'll hear the one on the next page.
Okay, so you, I don't know how comfortable people felt with the second one, um, but it's a great illustration of the dilemma that we have all faced as, you know, we musicians, as we've worked on making English uh, settings for these hymns that are so dear to people's hearts. If you know a hymn in Greek, you know the melody. And the melody, you know, generally, it's intimately connected with the text for you. And um, this is pretty obvious, but I'll just go ahead and say it. Uh, most of you have probably thought about this a lot. When we take a new language uh, and we try to work something out to fit the new language to the old melody, we have to compromise in some way. So here are the three ways that people compromise. Uh, three different kinds of approaches. Now, each one has some advantages and disadvantages. It's, there is no perfect solution for these, but I think it's really nice to point out to everybody that um, the, you, you end up choosing what advantages are most important for you, okay? So what, what we heard first, the uh, version of this, in 1997 is an example of minimal changes to the melody. Um, this was still uh, somewhat uh, more daring than it, those of you who remember the old green book, the Ernie Villas hymnal, uh, that, there there were absolutely no changes to the melody. There were just English words kind of stuffed into the melody uh, so that people without, you know, who knew these melodies well, would just feel comfortable singing in English of some kind, okay? And um, what's the advantage? Well, as I just say, you can feel comfortable. You, you know this melody in Greek, you can sing in English, and uh, it's, it's effortless. What are the disadvantages? Well, you get some pretty freaky English, right? And sometimes really odd stuff. Sometimes it's, uh, I mean, I didn't provide examples uh, for this uh, talk, I didn't go looking. Uh, but um, I would I would say for for um, for us now when we're looking at these uh, hymns I, I've seen uh, uh, Nancy Takas who's generally uh, not going to use this kind of approach but because this is a popular melody and she wanted to she wanted to make it easy for people to sing she has uh, shine forth oh shine forth shine forth oh New Jerusalem all right so. She uses the word fourth, which is pretty good. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And then there's a couple O's. And then the end, she has three of them instead of two. Now you may say, well, who cares? Well, you know, it's not a terrible thing to, to say this three times. But um, I mean, anybody who knows this in Greek or in some other language knows, you know, we get twice, shine, shine, that's it. And uh, so that's, um, that's the first method. Now the second method we see just very clearly right there on the shine shine. So Kiriakos, just just uh, the the if you turn to the the first shine shine, which is on page four, um, yeah, there it is, the bottom of four. All right, so this this is faithful to the text, and it gives us a problem with the music, even though people know the tune, it's the same tune. It has like way too many notes on these measly two syllables, all right? And uh, one of my, you know, now departed uh, choir members at Dormition, who actually was uh, the, the aunt of, of uh, Maria, our, uh, our wonderful forum president for so many years, um, very Southern, uh, woman, although I think Greek was her first language, fantastic singer. She would laugh at me every time we came to this. And afterwards, she would make little jokes and say, Shan, Shan. So uh, I, I don't think it was just that the word was funny, but I think she knew this was a little, it was a little over the top. Too many, uh, too many notes for these, for these syllables. So this, this is a problem. Uh, if you are familiar with the grammar of Byzantine uh, chanting, you say, yuck, you know, that's not going to do it. 
So that gives us the third option. Um, and I, I first heard about this many, many, many years ago from Jessica Suki Palalis, who said, well, you should just rewrite the stuff. And um, well, what's, what are the advantages of that? Well, you get something that's part of the musical culture here, um, if you know what you're doing. And what are the disadvantages? Well, you get a melody that's unrecognizable. So people say, uh, how am I going to sing this? I, I just, I mean, we don't have that many, even choir members, much less people in our congregations who are like, uh, you know, musically so literate that they can just take something new out and feel perfectly comfortable singing something that's that different for them. So uh, that's, that's what we have here. Uh, now, what we did in, in the Oli Mazi group, which was so uh, really delightful, I wish, I wish somebody would have filmed a few of the, the more interesting little moments as we went back and forth trying to uh, come to some agreement about some of these questions. Um, what we did is try to try to be faithful to the, the text. Well, we had to. That was a mandate. Try to be um, faithful to the norms of Byzantine chanting and also try to preserve some kind of uh, what Father Seraphim calls melodic reminders. So if you do this job well, and if you're lucky, if the text you know, isn't too different in number of syllables and all, you can, you can do something that's somewhat different, but, but doesn't make people think that they've never heard the piece before. And I obviously, I think that's, that's our goal here. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less easily attained. But I suggest that uh, we consider um, if, if people are able uh, to, for example, uh, look toward, in this case, something more like what I did this year, rather than continuing to sing uh, the, the piece from 25 years ago that was published by the uh, Southeastern Federation in, in the liturgy book that I did then. Um, if you can do it, I think it would be really great. So, I mean, we, we already kind of sang through it. I hope people looked at it. I don't know, you know, how much of it seemed like radically different. And I hope people will, you know, share their thoughts. Here's why I really hope people will share their thoughts. I'm coming from a place where I think this music belongs to the faithful. It belongs to, as we say in the South, you all, right? It's yours. And that feeling of ownership of this music is a, is a great pastoral treasure. It helps us connect with, with the work of the church, and it helps us internalize the message of the church. So we shouldn't blithely uh, discard. I mean, I think there's a danger to saying, ah, we'll just rewrite something. And in fact, uh, there's a, you know, there's a few examples of people just, I think, going too far. Anyway, that's, uh, that's an overview of what, what's been happening the past 25 years uh, with regard to um, new translations, um, new musical settings. Okay, so now uh, just to, let's see, how are we doing here? Yeah, it's getting to be time. So let's, um, let's look at the fourth and fifth Sundays of the season. Um, and I suggest looking at the revised one. Um, so that fourth Sunday will be at, uh, that's page 14. And let's kind of sing through that. This was basically done in 2008, volume two of the, the liturgy book I published with the Southeastern Federation. Um, what's revised about it is the opening part. So this gives you a chance to hear the opening part, which is different from what you're used to. And then the Traparian, with one voice, with the faithful. Well, that's the same thing that, that I said, uh, put out in 2008. By then, I was getting a little better at this. I think uh, the Byzantine grammarians among us probably would hate that a little less than they, they uh, felt uh, for the earlier stuff. So if Kyriakos, if you could put this on. Something. I'm going to make sure I have the right recording. So if 
if I don't have the revised one, um, I might have to switch it out. Oh, I, you know what? I don't you're think you said right. Revised, but, yeah, you're, you're yeah. right. I didn't. So I didn't. You know, so let's go to page twelve. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for reminding. Make sure. I'm looking at what I've got here. And I'm like, yeah, I don't yeah, have yeah. a revised yeah, one. Yeah. So. I'm sorry. That's okay. All right, I'll put this one on. So you can see how different the character was when we um, finished that um, initial musical segment and and started in on um, I can't see it so uh, let me find it here yeah yeah with one voice see obviously much slower and 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 you know it doesn't have to be that slow either. Uh, depends, as I say, on you know the room, the 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 the, the group of singers. Um, anyway, uh, let's go ahead and look at the the fifth Sunday, and we're doing the unrevised version, which is page sixteen. Well, look at that. There it is. All right. So uh, I don't know how others feel. For me, this one is particularly moving, um, shining more brightly than the sun and, uh, and filling all the faith with light. I mean, it's just, it, it's a great, um, it's always felt to me like a great moment in the liturgical year to sing that. And uh, I think now we're getting to the point where I'm supposed to stop, but if there's time, I thought it would be nice to play through the Thomas Meglinarian, it's fairly short, but someone tell me, you know, if we need to stop. Yeah, let's let's sing the English one. I think I put that one a recording. If if I, I have both, would you like the revised? Oh, the, yeah, let's do the revised one. I, I, I wouldn't. I mean, I hate to say it. I'm responsible for both, so I'm just giving myself a hard time. But I I would say if anybody learns this for the first time, learn the revised one because it's not that familiar. Uh, and it's not that different, but it's just uh, here the language is manipulated so you don't have the wrong number of notes per syllable. But that now that's the 
unrevised that we're looking at. Yeah. So here we go. All right. So I'd heartily recommend that, you know, if, if you have a few people, I know that the Sunday of Thomas is generally not a, a day of huge choir uh, attendance, uh, but maybe you just have two. And if one of them is a beautiful singer, how can you do better than this? If you have a group and you want to do the little optional moment of harmony, uh, forgive my self-indulgence there, but I, I've always enjoyed that. Uh, I think it's nice, but you don't, you don't have to do that for the thing to make uh, to make sense. So I guess that really does cover it, and uh, I'm happy to yield to questions. Thanks, Kevin, <clears throat> and uh, um, I think we're open for questions now, either of Kevin or Father James. And uh, Barbara is going to, uh, I think, handle this. Father James already has a question. I have a question, question for Kevin him. about that la last one um, about, uh, I, I, pardon my ignorance, but th that's, uh, that's the same hymn or the same melody as the, other, as the other five. It's certainly the same tone. And there's a, like you experience, there's a feeling of connection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, there, that's, that's not a coincidence. Uh, you know, that's, the, as you immediately realized, there's some sense to this. That's great. Well, the, the theological sense, too, too for me, I, I, I saw that. But you, you brought out with the, with the melody that I just had no clue of. So that's, that's fantastic. That's nice. Um, Kevin, uh, a, a few questions were sent my way. Um, one is, um, is, are these hymns available in Greek? You know, um, the, the one, the Megalodon for Thomas, I have everything that I've given you, uh, how am I going to say this right? Everything that I have in Greek, you have in front of you. The fourth and fifth Sundays, I didn't do them in Greek because I just thought if somebody wants them in Greek, they're probably going to have a chanter that wants to sing them in Greek. There's a lot of, you know, just sort of practical thinking. The book was already big enough. And so that I had Megalinaria in that volume two of the liturgy book, which is, you know, you can't really get anymore, um, published by the Southeastern Federation. Um, I just had a lot of Megalinaria only in English because um, of the space limitations. So the Greek one's available, obviously, the Paschal one and the one for Thomas. Okay. Um, and another question is, um, um, they want to know why the uh, newer translations don't contain the uh, tenor bass line. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know quite what you mean. The newer you translation. I mean the revised, the revised versions but, yeah. don't contain. The revised versions are unison. What? No, they're all, they're all the same. They're just Melody Eson. The 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 oh, old yeah. ones from 1997 are Melody Eson. See, that's Melody Eson. Uh, that's the revised one. And if you go up a couple pages, that's the one from 1997, and they're the same. Okay, I I guess I guess this person this gentleman wanted four parts or something. Right, right, right. So, you know, um, I, I have to say, this is an interesting question. 
um, so much of what I came up with um, was influenced by, by the music I saw people familiar with a long time ago now. I mean, we're talking 1985 or something like this. Most of the Tone One stuff that people in the parishes I happened to be going to were singing were just Melody Eason. And so, you know, when I did English versions of these things, I just kind of followed that pattern. Um, so, of course, then, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, world of interest in this question. I, I mean, I have to say, on, on Monday, I'm doing a, a panel discussion with uh, distinguished Alex Lingus and, and uh, Benedict Sheehan uh, and, and another uh, church musician about harmony in our church music. Like, there are people who say, no harmony at all. And, and they really just think that parallel thirds are of the devil or something. And uh, so anyway, I, I always thought, you know, I was at least giving the people who liked Melody Eason something uh, that they would be grateful for with uh, Tone One and, and Plago One just being in two parts like this. The, the other too, Kevin, is when you think of some of these special hymns of the feast days, they're only done once a year. <laughs> Um, or they're, they're not done all the time. So when you think of parsing your rehearsal time, it helps to have it unison or, you know, melody and eson. It's practical. So and that's why, you know, in the Thomas Megalinarian, that's why I wrote the, the little moment of harmony in, in optional notes. You know, if you have the people who are good and they want to just sort of break into harmony, well, that's nice. But if you don't, you get the same, you know, melody eson thing that we had all along. But that, that's a really interesting question, and it shows us um, how this, this, if you will, problem or question of harmony is just, it's just affecting us all. Um, what's the right kind of music to sing in our churches? And um, do people have, you know, sort of discomfort with one or the other? And, and uh, you know, I, I'm very eager to hear anybody's thoughts about this. Hey, K K Kevin, can you hear me? Yep. So the reason I ask that is because at my church, um, we're using the old Nicholas Rubanis music from years ago. And um, that's all I sing is I sing four part bass line. So that's what I'm familiar with. Right. So when I don't see, you know, I'm looking at the music and by the way, just very beautiful music, you know, shout out to you on this. I get lost and I, I'm, I'm quickly trying to have to think, where's my note, where's my note? So that's where I was asking, you know, where's the baseline? Where do I need to try to fall in here to oh, make it I sound see. pretty? Well, yeah, you know, now look, uh, thank you for, for clarifying. What, what I've found most successful in a typical choir is the men sing the Eason and the women, you know, because usually we have you know, frankly, more women, and some of them are really good. Oh, you should have heard, Maria Karitsis, you should have heard her aunt. I mean, what a beautiful voice. And I mean, they're, they're, most choirs have at least, a, you know, one or two really beautiful sopranos, you know, so you, you, you give them, uh, you know, you got to be selfless as, you know, it's, it's what the guy has to do here. Give them the beautiful melody and, and we just do the grunt work and sing the Eason. But that's, that's the way they're, that's the way they're conceived. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I have is there another question. Uh, yes. Um, um, well, it's kind of a comment and a question. The newer version seems more free flowing with the meter frequently changing more emphasis on the text, perhaps a challenge for some choir members to learn um, a beautiful arrangement. And uh, he wants to know, are these your own translations? If not, what is the uh, text source? Oh, that's great. Yeah, so um, as Vicki briefly mentioned, my first real encounter with the Orthodox Church was New Skeet, which joined the OCA. So basically these, the translations, well, I, I guess really just the Paschal Megalinarian, that's pretty much the OCA translation. And then 
for the others. Um, I used some some new ski texts and I looked all over. <laughs> and, you know, like, for example, the Thomas Megalinarian, that was 1997. I honestly don't remember. I don't know where. I mean, it's, it's been a long time. And even the, uh, the fourth and fifth Sundays, I, <laughs> I honestly don't know. But I, they're not, I mean, how can I say? There's no question about messing with the language to fit music or um, there's certainly nothing very personal. There's no like agenda. I mean, I think, you know, as I think of it for the fourth and fifth Sundays, I think I looked at um, North Express because by then they were putting this stuff out. So I know that that's very likely for the stuff from 2008 which is the fourth and fifth Sunday. So. Okay. And there aren't other questions, but there are some comments, um, compliments. Um, you know, somebody commented that um, she really, really liked what you did with this uh, Sunday of Thomas hymn. Thank and um, um, another person said that they've sung uh, these um they've sung them in both Greek and English and really finds it um, interesting to compare the, the translations, the revisions and, and so forth and, and you know, finds that refreshing. So, um, and then, oh, here's another comment. In some instances, it seems the, uh, oops, it went away, sorry. Um, it seems in some instances uh, the unrevised music maybe may uh, better paint certain words. Um, you think the number of notes per word traditionally is more important? You know, I, I'd like to just get personal here um, and say two things. When I was first doing this, there was no, there was no way for me to know anything about um, the quality of what I was coming up with, except the parishioners around me. If they would struggle with something, I would say, no, 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 it's not working. And if they could do it, uh, I realized this is pretty much what we need. Then over years, people, you know, it, it got to be easier to communicate over, you know, distances. And also people became more educated. I remember hearing about Jessica's project to catalog the Byzantine formulas. And I mean, she didn't really have to finish it because Father Ephraim in um, Arizona, he did it. And boy, the kind of work that took. But now, you know, you can look and see what's legal and what's not. And uh, how do I know anything about this? All I know is if if people feel that it's a little untoward because it doesn't honor these melodic conventions, then I haven't done my job. So some people won't feel that because they don't know the, the musical language as well. And uh, <laughs> okay, I'll give you, this is a fun little example from the Ole Mazi group. Um, the ordinary, Sunday Kinonikon, praise the Lord from the heavens, which that's, that's what's in the hymnal. So the people who say we cannot have three syllables, uh, three notes on one syllable and one note on the next, we cannot say praise the Lord, can't do it. I mean, these people absolutely were adamant, can't do it. So they would say, Praise the Lord. And the other people, the choral people, would say, can't have the word the with two syllables. You just can't do it. And well, I mean, you, you can look it up. I'm not going to give it away. You look it up in the, the new green hymnal and you see which prevails. But, but these are diametrically opposed aesthetic perspectives. The, a, a syllable like the, you don't want to elongate it. That's the choral, you know, kind of uh, tradition that, that we all, you know, 
think of when we think, you know, Handel and, and, and Mendelssohn oratorios or whatever. Um, a chanter apparently might find it very distressing to hear, praise the Lord. So, so there we go. The music that we sing in church is supposed to bring us together. It's supposed to be something that unites us, ideally. So for that, for, for that music to do its job, we have to find a way as best we can. Sometimes, you know, the compromises are simply not going to be there. But as best we can to make everybody feel like this music belongs to them. It's, it's an, a part of the church experience. It's not some, some guy who wrote something and, 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 you know, tried to either make a few bucks on the side or make a name for himself or whatever. It's, it's music of the church. So, so these are some of the, I mean, it's, it's in a way, a lot of trivialities that you confront when you, when you look at these questions, but the total result uh, can be something that, I mean, the, the highest compliment I've been paid and, and it's been more than once. Um, if a Bishop comes afterwards and says, with this music, I can pray. So it doesn't, I mean, they don't even notice, like what, why? Uh, but they knew that it, it felt like it belonged to them, it belonged to the church, and it didn't call too much attention to its eccentricities, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, and for our last question, um, Father, um, and since you've been in, in many parishes, um, Someone is at saying, I assume that your own choir chanters use the special versions on the fourth and fifth Sundays. And he's wondering if you are aware of other choirs in your metropolis or in the metropolises in which you've served um, that are doing this as well. Um, because a lot of, I guess he's aware that a lot of choirs don't do it. And uh, now that more resources are available and more of the composers are, um, are writing these special versions. Um, it would be nice for choirs to pick up on this. And he just wondered, in your being in many parishes, have you noticed if they're doing these or if they're just singing the same one uh, all during this whole season? Uh, you, you know what? This has been a superb education for me, this whole process, um, because um, I, I would guess that I had assumed that they were uh, doing that, and that's still my guess that uh, they, they do it just because of uh, people like change, but also you bring out a very good point that your practice, especially these days, is very limited. Of course, we don't have choirs uh, now and that type of thing. And so I do, I do have a couple of, uh, um, I, I haven't noticed, that's the easy answer, um, but uh, um, I I, I, we, we primarily the last boy, um, last two, certainly the last two or three, we, we print out ages initiative. And, um, and so that's, that's what we have available there. And Father, uh, yeah, I can just interject. We have been singing the, the, um, correct one, uh, uh, correct ones. If that's the way I want to put it, the changed ones. We've been singing that for several years at the Holy Spirit. Just for information i mean trying to help answer the question i guess and that that that's that's uh, th those that have done ages initiative that's what i would say is the case yeah. well you know I, i've been in the choir um th this is the first time in 50 years well other than last year when nobody was in church but the first time that i did not sing in the choir for the anastasy that i sat in the pews and uh <laughs> because I joined the choir 51 years ago. Uh, but um, many years ago, we just sang the same one every Sunday, weren't even aware of the change because that was what was in the music that was available. It wasn't anywhere. The resources and then weren't there. As time went on and composers like Kevin did put, they, they made those available. And then so we became smarter, we became better, we became more correct because it was like, oh, here, here it is. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't have the liturgical guidebook in the early years. And so 
whatever was in the, the book that we were doing, whatever, whosoever music we were singing, that's what we sang. Um, and so now we're more correct, thanked, you know, thanks to the composers and the guidebook um, that now we're more aware and we have the resource, we have the music. I, I have a couple of questions, Barbara. I didn't write them down. <laughs> um, one for Father and one for Kevin. Um, Father, I just didn't hear the year you you gave when you thought the hymnographers might have of of um, the year for the Megalinadion. <laughs> yeah, uh, assuming it's uh, John Saint John of Damascus, uh, it would have been the early. Uh, well, pro probably closer to the. Uh, Eight eight hundred somewhere eight uh, twenty thirty forty depending on how late it was. He died in I believe eight fifty or eight forty. Eight hundred. So that means it's uh, what I, I, it always impresses me, and it impresses other people to think that we're singing a hymn that is what uh, 1200, 1200 years yeah. twelve hundred yeah. years old. Actually, uh, sorry to interject. He was born in 675, and he uh, reposed in 749. Okay, so about a century. So a little older. 2,500 years. Yeah. So we're looking at 13 to 1,400 years old almost. Yeah. 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 I, had, I had him a century too, uh, too early. And you're probably century. thinking the 8th century, and yeah. then you said 800. 700. I, do, oh, yeah. I do that all the time. I yeah, do. yeah. Everybody does that. <laughs> and then for Kevin... Um, this is a, a sort of a, a directing thing I noticed. At the end, the very last measures of each of your hymns, you slowed down on that last, you know, the, the extra mm. notes on those last two syllables. And so often you hear directors saying, don't slow down the ending, don't slow down the ending. But I noticed that you did. And I know that I'd like to know what your rationale was for that. Uh, yeah, sure. So I, well, first of all, I got to say, I, I was, this is my first experience with doing sound files from Finale. I mean, it's why a lot of people use this fancy music writing program, but I never did it before. But what it gives you is the chance to show how you would direct something. And I don't know these directors who don't want to slow down at the end of something like this. To me, this cadence that that's the same every week you know, uh, stretching out a syllable, um, it has a finality to it that you you don't get if you just barrel through and then hold the last note a bit. So, uh, and you, I'm sure if you were thinking about it, you noticed that there were some phrases that they pulled back a little bit at the end. Uh, and that's, to me, I think that's natural. If there's any doubt, um, I would just, you know, listen to a bunch of chanters and see if there are any chanters who just kind of push to the end no i don't think so i think maybe i'm wrong uh but we should look at the uh, i mean there's now lots of recordings historic recordings of chanters and uh, in any case maybe it's my background as a musician the kind of music i play most of the time um you would express a sense of conclusive finality by by stretching the end of something like this. I hope that. I think the that helped. Yeah, I I I tend to agree. <laughs> I think the role might not be just to stretch the ending per se, but to emphasize the text at the end by slowing it down. And I think it's the idea behind that maybe that adds more value. Um, if yeah. you just slow down the last two measures, regardless of what you're saying, I think that's slightly different than if you actually are intentional about what you're doing. Yeah. I, I just have to tell you how many times we, you know, people in this. Uh oh, uh oh, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so often what happens is we don't get an important syllable. My favorite word to end one of these hymns, it doesn't happen here, of course, tabernacle. So what are you going to sing? No, you know, <laughs> yeah. you can't do it. So it's very important that the translation, ideally, the translation has a good word <laughs> that's going to be the final, you know, syllable that that gets elongated and, as you say, gets stressed. So that you know, just be aware. Uh, 
And this came up sometimes in the Ola Nazi group too, like, ooh, you yeah. know, they, yeah. what do you do? <laughs> well, and I'm wondering how much of it also, when you think of the dialogue between the choir and the chanters and the priest that goes on, is it a cue to the priest, you know, to that is the priest, well, I, I'm blanking on what comes next after this, Father, but it, does that give a cue to the priest that, oh, it's almost time now for the next? <clears throat> That, that, that's, that's a very great point uh, that I appreciate uh, all, all the time because uh, the, the, the priest is counting on that because there's so many other liturgical things that are going on uh, that, that he needs that, uh, you know, especially during Orthros. Um, uh, but yes, that, that's, that is part of it. Um, and yeah. I also... Yeah. Um, that, that brings to mind, uh, Vicki, am I, can, you can hear me? I'm, yes. Okay. Um, it brings to mind of a uh, priest that I was uh, under when I was in Ephemarios. Um, he, he had been trained uh, uh, teleturgically, liturgically at either Athens or Thessaloniki. Uh, and I learned so much from him. And he, he talked about how there is an ebb and flow, but everything flows from the altar. It's not a power thing on the part of the priest, but it is, it's a, a, an ebb and flow. So it goes from the priest to the chanter, to the choir, to the people, and back again. And uh, that's, that's a, a, a nice just uh, going back. Uh, it would be, be nice to have, uh, you know, much more uh, uh, c community uh, singing, community involvement in singing, that type of thing, because as we talked about last night, these are these are theological. This is the way music puts the theological concept uh, to where people people understand it. So it's something, if if I can, um, it's uh, something Barbara had said earlier um, regarding um, the the debt of gratitude we owe to people like Kevin and uh, 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 Father Seraphim and and uh, another one. I have my Holy Week book down here. Uh, Father Papadeus, and I was able to thank some of these people because for me, an, a native English speaker, and for those that, you know, it's the, the music may not be able to read Byzantine chant or something like that, um, what the service that uh, Kevin and you folks like that have done for the church is, is you know, is, is tremendous, and uh, thank you. I think um, we're, I don't want to rush anybody off, um, but I do want to remind those people who are starting to leave that we have two of the two little survey questions, takes you about 20 seconds to answer them, um, if you would do that. But we're, we're here to continue, um, you know, as, as long as you'd like. If there are any other questions, why don't we take those first and then some people might just want to stay on and just talk. Are there, are there any more questions, Barb? Well, uh, just to let them know that if they go to the screen and click on polls, that's where they'll find those uh, survey questions. Um, and I, I think now, um, uh, how about if I just unmute everybody? Yeah. Everybody can unmute if, if they have any comments. Um, Barbara, I think you have to launch the poll unless oh. it might be different online. Oh, no, people launched. are answering it. Okay. It just opened on my end. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, you, you can unmute if you have a comment or a, a question. And um, um, but and next we, we hope we hope to have this uh, this registration uh, uh, situation. I, I, I'm not sure what that's all about. We have to write Zoom and ask them what happened. Well, yeah, and and a few people texted me saying that they were trying to get on and they never did show up. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but but this um, is being recorded for any of your choir members um, who were not able to attend. This is being recorded, and it will eventually be put on the both the webs of uh, the um, MEFGOX and the uh, National Forum websites. Right, Vicky? Yes. Both? Yes. So Father, are there any other questions? Yes. Yes, William. Earlier, you. I thought I nasty father. Um, earlier, when you started, you were talking about um, how the Theotokos is 
our gateway, the the temple of every you know of everything pretty much. She she was the temple to hold Christ, and then was the you know how the Protestants really don't revere her until now. I mean, I can tell you from firsthand experience, a lot of my Protestant friends are turning and saying, "Do you have any prayers to the Virgin Mary I can use?" I'm like, oh yeah, here here's my whole book full of them. Um, <laughs> but one prayer that I love especially, and it's I don't know how often everybody gets to hear it. Um, standing in the temple of your glory, we feel as though we are in heaven. O Theotokos, heavenly gate, open for us the door of your mercy. And that comes from the very end of the orthodox service. And it's just, it's always been one of my favorite prayers. And I don't know, it's not said in my church, but. Um, it 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 um, if I, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't have my liturgicon in here, but I believe that's one of the prayers that the priest is praying inaudibly just prior to uh, the doxology, or okay, yeah. while, while the doxology is occurring, or after he's already sensed, and uh, he's praying those last prayers just before uh, uh, the the divine liturgy of Logi Mani. Yeah, I guess right. Before I, so that's why I'm, you don't hear it. Yeah, I'm usually in the altar still helping before the, the last altar boys run in before the, the service starts. So I get to hear it. And then as soon as they're there, I'm running over to the choir because it gives me enough time to get from point A to point B. Well, the, it's, the, it's, the priest is speed reading it. Yeah, he, he's, <laughs> yeah, he speed reads. <laughs> By the way, the Slavs have a reader say that. And I've seen some Slavic choirs sing it. That That's wow. prayer, yeah. So you know, it's it's interesting, but it, that, yeah, that's familiar. Uh, you know, not just in my experience from from the altar. So, Father, this is Miriam. Um, I was fascinated that you said the Protestants are just discovering Panagia. Uh, do you have anything, any insights into that? I haven't read any of those articles, but I thought that was really interesting to hear because many times when I talk to Protestant friends, they don't really relate to the whole concept of saints and the sense that there are, there are real people around us who are there not only to intercede, but to love and to love us. Well, and, and um, I, this is where the Timothy Ware, the Orthodox Church um, book for me was the book, and it was really the, um, uh, the, the introduction where he's talking about a Russian theologian and he's answering about uh, to a, an English audience, primarily Catholics and Protestants, probably Anglicans, and um, they're in a sense still fighting that battle. And that's that's he talks about the algebraic equation datum a uh, a plus, and in the case of the the Roman Church, and the a minus in the case of the Protestants, because so much of the Protestant was a, a, a reaction in Western Europe, um, Northern and Western Europe to what it was going on. And so in certain cases, they were throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I, I, I think, and I had gone to a, a Protestant seminary before my dad was a Baptist minister. And you start to ask questions um, about certain things uh, like that. Like, okay, why do other Christians believe this? And ultimately you're going to find, and I think that's uh, in the case of the article, um, uh, uh, the gentleman was a, he was a Princeton seminary grad, and um, they, they introduce it that uh, 500 years ago, he probably would have been uh, uh, killed for, uh, he would have been a martyr for his, uh, his, his belief. Um, he wouldn't have been able to hold that. And that's, that's what happened in Western Europe at that time. And a lot of those things are still con uh, continue on, just like we hold on to certain traditions that are just not existentially uh, uh, what we can hold on to today. It's, it's uh, uh, so, it, yeah, they, they, um, they're coming along as slowly. I, I still know a lot, a lot of Protestants that don't buy into that. Others, my best friend is an evangelical minister that I think he's probably hanging on to it in some sense to, to a thin economical thread. Um, so, you know, you never know. You love Thank them. You. you love them. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the first fruit of the spirit. Joy is the second. 
Okay, um, I think it's time. Um, I'm looking at the time. It just went by so quickly, but uh, Kevin and Father James, you just filled it with wonderful insights for us. And uh, on behalf of everybody, we thank you um, for this evening. Thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, we'll we'll send you notice of next week. Next week, we're going to be. Um, using, looking at some of the couple of the hymns having to do with ascension, and uh, um, uh, Kristen Kristen Buskus will be the choral person, and Barbara, the priest, is uh, Father Nicholas Verderas. Good, wanted to make sure. So we'll see you then. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.